Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. I'm going to read that one more time. Follow the way of love and eagerly, everyone say eagerly. Eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Eagerly means a strong and overwhelming desire to have something. A strong and overwhelming desire to have something. This verse right here, I have several verses in my life that that throughout my life that I have went back to, verses that have challenged me, verses that have kind of become a staple in my life or in a period or a next step, if you will, in my walk with God. This verse right here is one of them. I can remember at a time in my life where you know, of course, I grew up and grew up in a great Christian home with the church, uh, gave my life to Christ at the age of six. Um, it just life was crazy. Things were great. Did the church camp thing, Bible school thing, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And every other night that a church door was open, you know, it was, uh, that was, it was just a part of my life. Jesus, God always been a part of my life. Went through that time where I went on my own path and my own, own dark road and, and, and just kind of walked away from all that and then came back and, and, and God was just blessing me in my life. But I just knew that there was something more that God had for me. There was another place, another level that, that God wanted to take me. And, and, and it was, this was a me thing. It had nothing really to do with anyone else. It was me. I wanted to grow. I wanted to learn. I wanted more of God in my life. Just kind of like we, we, we sang just a minute ago, I wanted something new. And I was going to do whatever it took. And, and this verse, when this verse, we were in the White House up above the sheriff's office. This verse. And I would read this verse over and over and over again in my life. And, and, and every day, multiple times a day. And this just became real. Eagerly desire. Overwhelmingly want something so bad. And so I began chasing, began chasing more of who God was and more of what I thought God had for me. A spiritual gift is a supernatural ability given to all Christians to do God's work on earth. All Christians. Everyone say all. Thank you. It's an ability given by God to tell all of God's people or to all of God's people, to make a difference first in the church and then overflowing into the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. I, I, I say that word respectfully, and the, the word of definitely in, in some of the translations the word used, but... According to one study, 87% of Christians don't know anything about their own spiritual gifts. The definition of ignorant is lacking education or knowledge, being unaware or uninformed. So basically what Paul is saying here is he said, I don't want you to be unaware or uninformed about these awesome gifts or this awesome stuff that the Holy Spirit has for you. I don't want you to be short on knowledge when it comes to understanding them. But unfortunately today, so many Christians are. We just, and, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know everything. I'm not standing up here on the stage today, on this Sunday morning, as we start this week three in our series, Ghost, telling you that I know everything because I don't. But for me, it's, it's, it's up to me to eagerly desire, to eagerly seek out, for it some, to be something that is so overwhelming that I just want to know more, understand more, and receive more from God. It's, but, but it's like we've been given these awesome gifts, gifts, gifts that can be used for awesome things, and we either reject them because we don't know anything about them, or hide them and just never use them. Rick always gives me great wisdom on Sunday morning. He really does. He has some fantastic stuff. I always share a little bit of a context of my message on Sunday mornings in our pre-service prayer time, and it never fails. Every Sunday, Rick comes up and just pours something into me. And, and this morning, he, it's just so, and he's so simple, and I just love that. He said, this would be like, he said, you know, when he, when he bought his daughter, Leali, a horse. And he gave that gift, that horse, to Leali, but he wanted Leali to enjoy that gift, to find joy in that gift, to use that gift. Not just, he didn't just buy her a horse to stick the horse out in the stable or in a field somewhere. But with that gift, came, it does, it comes responsibility. you got to feed the horse, clean the horse, water the horse, take care of the horse, teach the horse. 
ultimately ride the horse and, and, and get the benefit of the gift out of that. It's very similar in this situation. God has provided all this, this amazing gift for all, everyone say all, for all of us. And it's not meant to be stuck in some barn and just sit there. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture here in just a, a little bit later. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. And then verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Now, let me give you a few things that spiritual gifts are not. Spiritual gifts are not natural talents. Spiritual gifts are not natural talents. Christina has a natural talent to play the piano. A natural talent that was helped issued by my wonderful mother. Lance has a natural talent. Bill has a natural talent. My son, Rick, natural talent. That is something physically that they do extremely well. There's all kinds of natural talent. Now, I'm not saying at all that they're not of God. That's not what I'm saying. Okay? Because I do believe that gifts and talents are given to us. Physical gifts and talents to do things in this life are given to us by God, and they're meant to be used for the glory of God. Amen? But a spiritual gift is not necessarily a natural talent. It is not given to just an elite few. I think sometimes we get this, this, this thought and this feeling that only a select group of people get to receive God's gifts. And that is not the truth. If you go back to verse 7, it's for all, each of us, every single one of us. Every single one of us. Spiritual gifts are not a sign of spiritual maturity. Sometimes I think we, we see someone being used and, you know, just using the gifts that God's given them and, you know, the spiritual gifts that God's given them and we just get this thing, oh, I just, that, boy, I would love to get to that. But you are at that place. You're not below someone. You're not less spiritually mature. It's just, that's just something, and I believe it's the enemy that puts that lie into our heads to keep us from doing what God has gifted us to do. Spiritual gifts are also not fruits of the Spirit. Now, we'll be talking about fruits of the Spirit next week unless God changes something and I chase some rabbits. Okay? But that's my plan. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's different. Okay? So we need to understand that. And finally, spiritual gifts are not something to fear. It's not something to fear. It's not something to be afraid of. It's in the Bible, guys. I'm not afraid of that. I have a reverent fear of God, but God's Word excites me. It's alive, and it's relevant for today. You know, we talked about the whole ghost thing as it pertains to the series and and how, you know, as little kids, we're taught to fear ghosts. And so when we hear that word ghost, you know, spirit or ghost or whatever, it's just almost like this pushback. Guys, if anything, you should want to draw into that. So let your fear down. Let it go. Just for a little bit, just let it go. And let God speak to you. So let's look at some of these. We're going to be in a lot of Scripture today, so stay with me. I'm going to put all of my Scripture chapter references up on the screen at the end of service. Okay? Write them down, put them in notes, whatever, and then go study. Because as I told you in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, how it became, that study was my study. Now, I sought out wisdom from some people that, that spoke wisdom into me. I went to Pastor Buddy. I went to Pastor Gary. I went to Pastor Oren. I went to people that I trusted. Now, you'll notice I went to some different thoughts. I didn't just stick with one. Okay, I went to people that I trusted, even though they may think a little bit differently about certain things, I trusted them because I knew they loved Jesus and, the, and, and, and they loved people. I knew they studied. I knew they sought things out. And so I let them pour into me. And then as a good man that, that, that one day he spoke, I, this is a statement I've used for many, many years. And, 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 and evangelist, he's now a pastor 
um, down, I believe, in, uh, I think he's still in Alabama. His name is Joey Hip, and he came up, and Joey did a, a, a revival, for, actually a couple different revivals for us, but, but he said something one night in, in a revival service that rocked some of us, and we pushed back immediately, and he could tell it. I mean, and it almost to the point, I, if I remember correctly, it was almost an anger. And I'll never forget the next day we were over at what was then the staff building, which is now through the grapevine. And we were in there, we'd had lunch, and, and, and we were going through, and he said, man, let's just throw the elephant in the room. I ticked some of you guys off last night, didn't I? And we just all kind of stood there and went, hmm, what do we say to that? And he began to share his heart, began to share some things, and ultimately he made this statement. He said, guys, he said, everything that I say or God speaks to me isn't necessarily maybe not going to be for everyone. Eat the meat and throw away the bones. Grab a hold of what nourishes you and let go of what's choking you up. Don't, get, don't, don't let a bone get stuck in your throat that keeps you from something that's really, really good. Just thought I'd throw that out there. I don't know. Romans chapter 12. A lot of scripture today. Starting in verse 4. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Let me just stop and again say this. We are all in this together and it takes all of us doing our part. Every single one of us. And not just within Cross Point Church, mind you. When I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about the church. It takes all of us doing our part. I don't care if it's Ava Assembly, Ava General, United Methodist, First Southern, Highway Nazarene, Gentry Church, Good Hope. I don't care what the name on the door it is. It takes all of us doing our part. Can we agree on that? In verse 6, it says, in his grace, God has given each, each of us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. So much for the slow start. Let's just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tackle things as, as, as we get to them, okay? So let's just dive right in. Because a lot of people would say, when you start talking about prophecy and prophesying, all these different things, and, and, and the honest question is, is this stuff really still around? Because for a lot of people, this gift, along with another one we'll talk about here in a moment, just doesn't happen anymore. It's like Isaiah and Daniel and all of those minor and major prophets in the Old Testament took care of that. Well, if that was the case, then Jesus would have never prophesied in the New Testament. Amen? Just saying. You say, well, it ended with Jesus. Really? Because I know a guy, and you could say it's a dream, you could say whatever you want, but I know a guy that was stuck on an island that wrote one of the most amazing books that's in our Bible today. It's called Revelations. Say it was just a dream. Well, God gives a lot of things through dreams. I just, the Bible says it, I believe it. I, I, I just do. Malachi 3.6 says, for the Lord, I the Lord do not change. He says, I don't change. God wasn't one way in the Old Testament and one way in the New Testament. The one thing that changed everything was his son Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the law, to fulfill the law. God didn't change his mind on anything. God's not some different person, and God's not just evolving now that it's the year 2019. We hear that all the time. Well, you know, it's just a different time, and God's got a baloney. Whatever God's word said one year ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, or when it was written, is still God's word. And the Bible says we're not to add to or take away from that. Amen? I may shake some of you today, but that's okay. I'm good. Just know that I love you. I do. I love you. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from, from above, from God, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There's no wavering in any of it. God has not changed his mind on the scripture that he has written. If he did, he would speak it through someone and maybe something would change. But we know from the word of God that that is never going to happen because the Bible says the, this earth is going to pass away. But the word of God will never pass away. This is here forever. All eternity. It's not changing. Prophecy is a, the, the, the definition of prophecy is a prediction. One of the functions of the prophet. It had been defined as a miracle of knowledge a declaration or description or representation of something future beyond the power of human understanding to proceed, discern, or conjecture. 
beyond human understanding. Isn't that basically what God is with us anyway? How many of us really understand God? If you understand God and you understand him completely, come have a conversation with me because I have a ton of questions. Like, I don't understand God. Sometimes I think we get glimpses, right? We get glimpses into understanding what God's doing. And sometimes, and I do, sometimes I think he lets us see some little things to kind of boost our faith and, and our trust, but we don't. Isn't it crazy how you'll see a little bit of something and you think you know what God is doing, and the very next moment he does something and you're like, uh, wait a minute. Well, I thought we were going here. I just, I don't understand him. But I don't have to. I just have to trust him. I just need to trust him. I just need to trust him. God saw the need for the prophetic in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even now. We may not see it as much, but they didn't either. There weren't very many prophets that God called. Some of you have told, I've told the story in this church about Brother John Nelson. One of the most amazing men of God I've ever met in my entire life. He had a gift. He had a gift. And I'm the one that that saw that gift on more than one occasion. That man spoke into my life things that nobody knew. Nobody. Now, do I see that all the time? Nope. I don't. But I know that God used that man. And I know it was as real as I'm standing in front of you today. I also know the Bible says that God never changes. That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God sees a need for a prophet today, I think God is big enough and wise enough to find the one he wants and make sure that he or she is used. That's what I believe. Let's keep going. Verse 7. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. You get the pattern? And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, then do it gladly. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing kindness. These gifts are all cool, but you know what this speaks to me? Regardless of what gift that God has given you, use it. There was a little spit. (laughs) Use it. If God's called you to, you know, to teach, then do it. Some people know. Some, some of you may know exactly what God's called you to do, what your gift is, what the spiritual gift is. Not physical, may not be singing, playing, what your spiritual gift is. Do it. Do it. Use it. Now, one of the obvious questions for a lot of people is how do you know which gift you have? There's a lot of ways, and we're going to talk about some of those, a few of those, how we can look at that here in a little bit. But first, I want to give you kind of a simple, fun way of knowing which gift that you have. Uh, I I, I got this from Craig Rochelle, and and it's it's really kind of amusing. But if you think about this in context, it's kind of right. Imagine you're at a table. This is called the apple pie demonstration, by the way. Imagine you're at a table with a bunch of people and there's someone about to eat an apple pie and their apple pie is on the edge of the table about to fall off. You see they are vulnerable and yet they put their fork in their apple pie and it flops in their lap. What do you do? Because what you do next helps, could help to determine possibly what one of your gifts is. If you would say, I almost told you that was about to happen, and you shouldn't have done that. I saw it coming. Well, then you might have the gift of prophecy. (laughs) Maybe you should have spoke. That's kind of funny. On the other hand, some of you might say, oh, man, let me help you clean that up. Here's a napkin. Let me wipe you up. Here, let's get you taken care of. You may have the gift of serving. You see a need, and you jump right in, and... Take care of it. Some of you might say, oh, I've researched this, and really there's a better way to eat apple pie. Step one is you do this. Step two is you do this. And step three, please do not let the apple pie spill in your lap. If this is you, then you might have the gift of teaching. 
Some of you might say, oh, that's awful. I feel for you. You know what happened to me one time? Don't worry about it. It's okay. Watch this. And you just throw a piece of apple pie in your own lap to make them feel better. If that's you, you could possibly have the gift of encouragement. Maybe someone would say, oh, here, take mine. In fact, bring apple pies for everybody and put ice cream on it. You might have the gift of giving. Those of you who would say, we can get this cleaned up in no time, you go get this, you go get this, and I've got a vision to make it better, you might have the gift of leadership. And then there might be some of you that say, my heart sinks. When it was falling in your lap, I was hurting for you and with you, and I'm just so devastated what you're going through right now. If that's you, you might have the gift of mercy or kindness. It's kind of a simple, fun little illustration, but it does make you think. Because we all respond differently, right? Don't we all respond differently to things in life? Some people are just kind of even keeled, happy-go-lucky, just smooth. Some people, that's me sometimes. Not as bad as it used to be, but it's still me. I overreact to just about everything. Over, I don't even know how to say the word, dramatize, is that the word? Yeah, just, yeah, basically. Lacey's going, yep, that's it, mm-hmm. Yep, that's the one. God has given us gifts to be used in the church to minister to other believers and to be used in the world. Quite honestly, many of us don't even know what our gift is. We're not sure. Or maybe some of you do know what it is and you've tried to hide it. You try to put it away. Probably because of fear. Remember, we should eagerly desire our gifts, and then use them. So let's keep going. Let's jump from Romans to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To the one person, the gift, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice, and to another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. See, some of you people come to you often because you, you give great advice. Sometimes you just do. Sometimes you have biblical spiritual knowledge. I went to Mike this morning for knowledge because I knew Mike had knowledge. Do I use a blade or do I use a box blade? Mike gave me wisdom. I didn't go to my daughters with that question, I can tell you. Because <laughs> they don't know anything, but I knew Mike did. I knew Mike had the wisdom to help me. And also know that whether he's right or wrong and I totally destroy my road, that what he gave me was honesty from his own heart and wisdom from the things that he had studied. And that's just what I know. Some of you have that. You have wisdom. You have that. People come to you and ask you for advice. Sometimes people come to you and, and, and just, you know, to seek guidance or, or whatever it may be. It's like you're tapped into a different level of knowledge that this gift of God that he's given you, and you should use it often. Never should be abused or taken advantage of, I can promise you that. You should understand where it comes from. Sometimes wisdom is not speaking, but just listening. But use it. Verse 9. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. Here we are again with this, some of this scenario we talk about faith. Are we supposed to all have faith? Yes, we are. Every single one of us are supposed to have faith, but there's a measure of faith or a gift of faith that is given to certain ones to just have more. They're the ones, and you might be one of them, that regardless of the fact, you just know that God's got it. You just know that God is in control, and you can be that encourager. By the way, you can have multiple gifts, you, and, and this is one where you, a lot of times the people that have the gift of faith also have the gift of encouragement. They kind of coincide, and they work together. But the, it's just that person. And, and again, it's not a flippant response. They truly believe that God is in control no matter what. And if that's you and you know that that's you, you need to use that. Because there are times in people's life when people need men and women of faith to stand up and, 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 and to, to live their life in this gift. It's so much needed. He goes on to say, and to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. Now, some people today, and I've heard it said, I've heard Christians say it, 
Jesus is the only one who healed. Healing doesn't take place today. I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. Before I tell you what I've seen, let me tell you what the Bible says. Because if you think that healing stopped with Jesus, then you haven't, you haven't left the Gospels. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer, and at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him. I love that. That's boldness. He just looked him straight in the eye. As did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Don't you like that? <laughs> I like that, walking and jumping. He told him to walk, and he said, ah, walking's not good enough. He probably just... Did a little jig, too, while he was at it. Acts chapter 5, verse 12, the apostles performed signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Verse 15 says, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least, I love this, at least Peter's shadow at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they pass by. Crowds gathered from all the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Peter's shadow. I love this correlation. Remember the last couple of weeks we've talked about the verse that, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the Bible says, lives in me. Remember the story back in the Gospels where all the woman had to do was go up and just touch the hem of Jesus' garment and she was healed? It didn't Jesus, it didn't, Peter's shadow, it's the same power. I'm spitting him. It's the same power. Jesus' garment, Peter's shadow, and the boldness. Peter looked him right in the eye. He had a surety, he had faith. It's just like he was saying, boy, your life's about to change. And I'm the only one that's going to change it. Get up. Get up. I believe in the healing power of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have seen it happen. I saw a little boy's arm one time, crooked as it could be. True story. And I wasn't the only one. And I saw a group of God-believing people grab a hold of this little boy. And it, I'm telling you, it was straight. I'm telling you, it was straight. I'm not just speaking. I'm, I'm, you're going to have to trust me when I'm speaking. I remember, I remember Batch. I remember when everyone, including doctors, said, ain't no hope. I remember it. I remember hundreds of us filling that room in that hospital that night before and singing and worshiping and praying and believing. And I remember a friend of his ripping off a piece of scripture and sticking it in his hand or in his bed. And it wasn't too long after that that his toe moved. People say, ah, oh, it's just medical. I don't believe that because all the medical said it, he was gone. All the physical wisdom said, there's no hope. And then today, he inspires people. He inspires people. He loves life. Now, I know the obvious question, and I'm not chasing this rabbit today, is, well, why does God heal this one? It's God's plan and his will. It goes back to the understanding. We don't understand God. I don't either. I don't. But I know this. God still heals today. Peter's shadow. Verse 10. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and the other the ability to prophesy. He gives someone the 
else the ability to discern whether a message from the Spirit of God or another spirit. Listen, some people just have the gift of knowing if something is of God or not. They just do. I, I, I believe that. We, they just discern. It's just something that they have. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. Okay, Pastor, on weird stop number two. And let's just, the elephant in the room, this whole speaking in tongues thing, that's scary stuff. Remember what I said, spiritual gifts are not, back in number five. and Number five in the, that whole list I put is spiritual gifts are not meant to be feared. I've heard some people say, well, I thought this was one of those gifts that wasn't around anymore. And I know that that's a topic of conversation. I know it's a topic of controversy. But the Bible says this, and I'm going to use this reference for this. Other people use different references. I'm going to use this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 10. I forgot we don't have this. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. That's a true statement. But love will last forever. Verse 9. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Verse 10. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. Let me get teachy for just a little bit. You can... Brenda, go back to verse... Go back to where we start, verse 8. Remember the time of perfection. All of this stuff will become useless, but love will last forever. All of these partial things, let's just talk about, let's just throw this whole big, let's just throw all these spiritual gifts into a bowl. Can we do that? The time of perfection, if you read this, and you can look in different translations, it says different things, but regardless of the fact, if you, and, and this is just from my study and looking at God's Word, but also just really diving into some theologians and, and some people that you know really say, most theologians believe that the time of perfection is when Jesus returns the second time. And when Jesus returns to this earth, okay, He will come and He will set up His kingdom. It's like heaven comes to earth, whole new heaven, whole new earth. At that particular point in time when he sets that up, when, 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 when the, the white throne judgment is done and then here we are in eternity with, you know, and, and he's cast judgment and, and Satan and the demons, everybody goes you know, to hell and everybody's like, I just think all these gifts that the Spirit gave us, remember, for what? For Yes, they're for us, but for the church and for others to learn about Jesus. When the time of perfection comes... Love is the only thing that's going to matter. Because love is the only thing you're going to experience. Love and the fullness of Christ. But in the meantime, in the meantime, and I don't care whatever gift you're talking about, I'm not going down, I'm not chasing this. We're, we could, this would be a topic of a whole other topic of conversation. People say, Pastor Ron, what do you really believe? What do you not believe? I can tell you exactly what I've experienced, I can tell you exactly what, what, what God's Word has done through my life, but this isn't about me, this is about what God's Word says, so that's where I'm staying. Can we agree on that? But I know this, that the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to all of us are meant to be used. That's what I know. They're not just to be left on pages in a book, because there is a place, and there is a proper place for all of them proper. Go study it. Go read it. Again, I'm going to give you scriptures here in just a little bit. Get after it. Study it. Learn it. You seek it. You eagerly, you know, you just dive into what, what, is, what has God given me? But see, when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, I have to believe the main thing is going to be that we made it in His presence. Let me throw this out there. Who is responsible for the power of God not moving in our lives, our services, our churches? Who's responsible for that? We are. It's not God. Because I can promise you this, and I say this with, I promise you that every single time we have a service in this church on a Sunday morning, God desires for us 
to go farther than we did. God desires for you personally to go farther than you did. Some of you will leave today thinking, boy, man, I got it all today. And God be like, no, no, there's more. It's us. To me, it's very easy to see why we don't see the power of God move through his gifts because we choose not to. This gift's too weird. That one's too scary. This one's just unbelievable. That one doesn't exist anymore. I can kind of see that one happening. I'll accept that one. The Bible says very plainly that the Holy Spirit gives gifts so we can help each other. What would happen in our families, in our churches, our communities, our schools, and our nation if Christians stood up and decided to stop picking and choosing what part of God they would allow in their lives and start allowing God and the Holy Spirit to lead them in His power for the sake of helping others? I'm going to read that again. I know that was a mouthful, but I want you to grab a hold of that. What would happen in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our schools, in our nation, if we stopped picking and choosing what we wanted to see from God and just decided to say, okay, God, whatever you want? What would happen? It would change it would change so much, radically change. It would be like a Jesus coming to earth kind of change. What if Christians would stand up and choose to become aware and knowledgeable of these gifts or the gifts God has for them individually and then start using them in the power that they were designed and given to be used? I mean, come on, we base, listen, we base our whole lives on a man whom 99.9% .9 of us and all the people who have ever lived and ever will live have never seen. You are here in this church today if you have accepted Christ and you base that relationship on someone that you have never physically seen. You are accepting that faithfully and trusting that Jesus was real, that He was on this earth, that He died on a cross, and that He was risen from the dead. And that He is alive today. You are basing that on trust and faith that he is in heaven today and he's coming back for his church and for his people. Yes, that's what we base that on, right? Come on. I mean, logic tells us that is so far out there. But if we can accept that and we can make that the basis of, 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 of who He is in our lives and the fact that we give our lives to Him, why can't we have that same kind of faith with what the Holy Spirit wants to give us daily in our lives to edify His people and help grow His church? That's a little bold preaching, but I'm just asking the question. We believe in Jesus. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Right? Jesus said it doesn't just stop there. Well, we know that, that, that the Bible says, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, it can't stop just at Jesus. Say, well, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in this ghost. Or I might believe a little bit in the ghost, but it's, it's that you, you can't just pick and choose. We can't pick and choose as Christians. We can't pick and choose as the church. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. Jesus is still the main thing. And the main thing will always be the main thing. I, I, I truly believe that. But God commanded us to go and tell people about his son and make disciples. And then he promises that he will send someone who will help us do this better than we can do it on our own. But so many times today, we're leaving the old spiritual bulldozer over here to the side. And we're picking up our little shovel that we're trying to dig this hole with by ourselves. When God is saying, oh, I've got so much more. So much more. So much more. Holy Spirit gives Christian or gifts to Christians to help us grow and help other people grow. When these gifts are given, they're meant to be used. By the way, just to leave this here, 
just as individual gifts are given to us, so are given to the church. Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 12 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Boy, there's all kinds of gifts going around. And it's all for the purpose of helping others grow and to grow his church. Because this is what I know. When Christ comes back for his church, he wants to come back for the biggest church he possibly can. As many people as possible. I'm going to give you a few things just really quickly. How do you discover your gifts? Right, I'm going to have these up on the screen. You can write them down. Take them for what they are. This is just number one. Study the Bible and what the Bible says about the gifts. These are the, the, these are the chapters that I've referenced today. I will reference 1 Peter chapter 4 in just a second. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians chapter 4. Write that down. Go study. Don't listen to me. Go, just go read. Let God speak to you. Number two, ask God to show you your gifts. Have you ever just asked God, God, would you please? And he may not show you immediately. It may be something that goes through a process. Have you ever just asked him, God, what, what do I have? What did you give me? Who am I? Ask him. Ask him. How do you want me to use these to make a difference? Number three, examine what you enjoy and do it well. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds kind of simple, but really, it may be just a part of who you are. What do you enjoy? I love this. I do. I love this. I love to be in front of you. I, I love it. Love it. And not in the wrong way. I do. I love it. I love helping people. Love investing in people. Love it. Look at what you enjoy. And then do it well. Number four. This may sound a little corny, but it might be a place to start for some of you. Take a spiritual gift test. So, well, that's just kind of weird. The internet isn't your God, although some people think it is. But it could be something simple that at least might give you some insight, a way to pray, what to look for. I put a, a, a spiritualgiftstest.com. I've taken it, by the way. Don't take this as biblical. That's not what I'm sharing. It just might be a place. Maybe you don't understand. Maybe you are searching. It's a place to start. Number five, do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Whenever you feel like God is calling you to do something, just do it. Just do it. I promise you that every single Sunday in this church, we get to this place in the service and someone wants to just throw their hands and their life up and worship God. And you don't. You don't. I promise you. And the Holy Spirit speaking, just let go, just let go. Just, oh, I want to let go, but I just can't. Maybe God has spoke something to someone for you to pray with somebody. You don't even have to know what you're praying for. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit worked that out. Sometimes just a hand on their shoulder. Let them know that somebody is praying with them, battling with them. And you sit back there and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you to go do that. And you're just like, Oh, that's just so weird. They're just going to think I'm just, oh. I promise you it happens in here all the time. Do what he's leading you to do and don't give a flip about what anyone else thinks about it. You share that on social media today. Pastor Ron said flip. Flipping right I did. Do it. Whatever God's asking you to do, do it. So today I'm going to close with this scripture. We're going to worship. And then we'll go home. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Each of you. Use them well to serve one another. Use them well. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. It's the purpose. 